All right, perfect. Uh, welcome everybody. As Marie mentioned, this is kind of part uh, one of three. So feel free to um, tune into the ones that you want. This, there's just so much information that we found that this worked better to kind of split these into um, stuff that would be mostly soft coded versus stuff that would be mostly hard coded versus physician updates. So we're starting with the stuff that would be mostly hard coded. So it's going to be radiology, pathology, basically the 789 codes. Um, goes a little beyond that, but we'll see. Um, if you're more interested in some of the surgical section, that will be tomorrow, same time, same place. Uh, I'm just going to start everything here with the fun legal stuff that we have to, which says that this presentation is um, accurate at this time. Things change, particularly in this COVID change. Stuff may be added um, and revised but this is current right now. All right, so let's just start with the numbers, right? This is an overview of the 2022 changes. And the first thing that you'll, you may notice that I get asked about all the time is why do your numbers at the bottom here, the totals not match what I see in my CPT book? And the reason is that the AMA publishes the changes in between versions of the book. So they list anything as a change that changed in between the last publication and the current publication. So that's going to be all the codes that were effective in July. In this case, um, there's codes effective April, October, throughout the year. I don't include those in my 2022 changes. So my totals are generally lower than what the AMA says changed, and that's the reason why. You can also see down here a little bit of a disclaimer. I also don't include it as a revision if it's only a change to the short or medium description. And if it's only a change, you know, maybe to a comma or, or something like that. All right, so we're going to start anesthesia. There's not um, generally any changes to the anesthesia section. This year we do have um, a couple of changes. So I'm actually starting with the deleted codes here, and then we're going to talk about the ones that replace them. So starting here, we just have two new anesthesia codes for percutaneous image-guided procedures, uh, two that are being deleted. Basically, they wanted to do this to provide more clarity between um, sections. Right now, the codes that are being deleted, you notice, just say spine and spinal cord. Uh, they wanted to actually break those out into the specific sections. And they're also doing some switching around because they're changing some CPT codes in the um, musculoskeletal spinal section. Okay. So right now, uh, for 2021, your code is based on whether it's a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure, end of story. Next year, we have these um, new codes that are six new codes that are replacing that. So you can notice that they're broken down by the type of procedure. So if it's drainage or aspiration, there's a set of codes for that. If it's destruction by neurolytic agent, there's another set of codes for that. If it's neuromodulation or other intervertebral, I can't speak today, that's going to be helpful, intravertebral procedures, we have more codes for that. And they are broken down by section. So you want to make sure you're using the correct one there. That's it for anesthesia. That's actually a big set of changes for anesthesia. <laughs> All right, let's move on to radiology. The radiology section kind of blissfully doesn't have a ton of changes this year. Um, so the changes that we do have, we have four new codes that have been added to capture trabecular bone score services. So these are um, not exactly new, but new to um, the CPT book. It's what it is, is it's a measurement of the structural condition of the bone. So it's not DEXA. Um, but it is actually something that can be calculated from DEXA or it can be calculated from other kind of digital x-rays. So basically what it does is to calculate the microarchitecture of the bone, how dense it is and well connected. It's just another um, 
measure to know what a person's fracture risk is, um, that kind of stuff. So these are broken out into 77089 is full procedure. 77090 would be um, actually preparing the data and transmitting it because someone else is going to do the calculation. 77091 is that calculation, and 77092 would be the um, healthcare professional actually providing the report on what the results were. All right, we have a few deleted codes, kind of the biggest of which is that 72275, the epidurography. Um, I was a little surprised by that um, because it is a fairly used code. Uh, the rationale for deleting it was the fact that um, radiologists are not typically performing this anymore. It, uh, according to the AMA, it's included in multiple other procedures, and you can see I listed those out there for you. Those are also in your CPT book. Um, what we have to keep in mind is that the AMA are physicians, right? They write these codes from a professional point of view. And so from their point of view, radiologists don't so much come in and do the epidurographies anymore. Uh, it's done by a single interventionalist most often. And so that is now gone. There's also a lot of parentheticals to guide you throughout the book in that. <laughs> they also deleted 76101 and 102, the complex motion body section. Um, Again, according to the AMA, these just aren't done anymore, so um, no need to replace them or comment too much on them. And then we have one code that was revised in the radiology section, and, and I've tried to highlight there for you. Basically, they replaced the word venous with vascular. That's the most important change there. Um, and then they just spelled out left ventricular, right ventricular. Okay. Editorial change only, basically. And that's it for radiology. I can't even remember the last time radiology was that uh, small, but that's kind of nice. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the lab and the pathology. There's actually, as has been the case, the changes here just seem to get more and more and more every year. But I tried to break them down for you. So we have one new code in the drug assay subsection for hydroxychloroquine. And that basically was because this drug was um, used a lot and purported to be useful for um, COVID at a certain point last year. And so it was um, being used a lot and had just a non-specific code up to now. So they wanted to be able to track that one in particular due to the COVID public health emergency. Um, this is definitely more physician, but I did keep it in this section just because I can, I can see it being used for hospital-based pathologist. So basically we have four new codes for the pathology clinical consultations. If you just read through them there a little bit, just read through the first one, it's a lot of words. Um, you kind of notice that they're being more, uh, they're much more in line with the e &M codes, right? They're dependent upon um, what the level of history is, what the level of medical decision making is. Obviously, this is a pathology consult, so you're not going to be doing a physical exam. And there's also a time component for each one of these now. So let's, this is going to kind of build on that there. So there's a lot of guidelines in the book that will help you out with this. Um, there they're uh, being a lot clearer as far as when these should be reported. So some of the important criteria is that this has to be requested, right? It can't just be the pathologist coming behind doing a second check without a specific request from the physician or other qualified health professional. Um, it has to be related to the pathology 
findings. I don't, th that one to me is kind of a give me, what else would it be related to? But um, <laughs> there must be some other question there. Um, or the other relevant clinical or diagnostic information, it has to require additional medical interpretive judgment, okay? Uh, it can also, though, be mandated if there's um, a state or federal regulation that would mandate uh, a consultation, that would be right there as well. And if you've got the AMA version of the book pages, there are actually three pages that go over the tables and additional instructions on the code selection in here. Okay. Um, as we said, it's got a time component. So you can either pick your level based on time or the level of medical decision-making and all of that is defined out in the book. Okay. The time is going to include everything that's done. If you can see my my uh, the second or basically third bullet there, time is the total time spent on the date of consultation, but it will not include time spent in activities performed by physical uh, by clinical staff. So it's going to be a review of medical history, review of test results, um, review of the current findings time it takes to arrive at the conclusion, comparing against previous studies, referring, counseling, documenting, all of that stuff would be included in time if using time to select. All right, and because of that, we deleted these two codes. And you can see these were a lot simpler, right? It was either limited or comprehensive, and it was without review of patient's history or with review of patient's history. So I've got up there, note that now the AMA is clarifying that if you don't review the patient's history, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be coding anything. It's not a consultation. Okay, so that's kind of an important change there. All right, molecular pathology. We have a new code for cytogenomic analysis using low pass sequencing analysis. And I just kind of put, cause that didn't mean anything to me initially. So that's basically just a high throughput um, technology that um, it uses publicly available uh, genome research to kind of fill in the gap. So, I mean, the theory here is let's not keep reinventing the wheel. We've already, you know, mapped out the human genome that can be used to fill in if the data is basically less than perfect. Okay, we just, um, I didn't put out the full description here because those 81405, um, those, the codes in that series would take three or four slides. So basically they just removed the, the code, um, the 81349 from 81405 because it now has its own code. Nice and easy. All right, the biggest area where things were added, as is typical at this point for the last several years, has been to the um, assays and the PLA codes, which tend to be specific. So I kind of tried to put, I'm not going to read all of these slides to you, but I tried to help you out a little bit with information um, from the Appendix O. Where I've got this, this is for um, this specific test. So um, if you happen to see that kind of stuff, that's what this is talking about. So 81523 was added. There's a little note there, don't, don't code that with 81521, which is also mammoprint. It's just a different number of genes that are being um, tested. Uh, we have 81560, which is the Plex immune for transplantation medicine. It's really pretty amazing what they can do anymore um, to take genetic material and actually predict risks. In this case, they're predicting the risk of rejection. Uh, this one's predicting the risk of distant mets for breast cancer. Okay, we have three new codes that were added to the chemistry subsection. Uh, it's just a quantitative um, elastase, uh, immunoglobulin light chains, and the interleukin-6. 
Um, I also tried to help out a little bit here because these aren't specific to any particular brand or test. Um, I, I did try to put some notes here as far as how these were currently being coded. Right, 13 new codes for antibody testing. So we have one for the smooth muscle antibody um, that would be used to test for autoimmune hepatitis. It's currently reported with 83516. We have some ANCA testing screens and titers. Those would test for autoimmune vasculitis. Currently reported using, again, some non-specific codes, which is what you would expect since we're going to more specific. Uh, Aquaforin has new codes. Usually that's testing for pneumomyelitis optica. Those are also being reported right now with nonspecifics. Um, these are three new codes that are typically, these are all performed together is what I'm told. This just allows for specificity for when you're testing for celiac disease. A disease that sounds absolutely awful, MOG-associated disease. It's a rare disease, um, but this will allow for uh, specific reporting of the testing for that. Mitochondrial antibody used for primary biliary cirrhosis testing and the voltage-gated calcium chest testing for um, muscle weakness to try and suss out what is causing that. And we have one new code in the microbiology section. This is a generalized code. It's going to be used by multiple manufacturers, but it's just um, either using DNA or RNA culture typing. PLA, we're going to, we're going to buzz through these because there's a lot of them, 21, I think. Um, again, they have huge, awful descriptions, but I tried to put down here for you the lab and the specific test that this is um, explaining. So if you remember, PLA codes um, are for a particular test, a particular manufacturer, so they can't be used um, for anything that's close. 0285U is going to be for the RAD RADTOX CF DNA test by that specific lab. So I will let you um, look at those at your leisure. There are, as I said, 21 of them. Um, there's a whole sequence here of these new MindX blood tests, which purport to give a predictive risk score for um, several different brain conditions, Alzheimer's, uh, prediction of pain tolerance. I don't know, this stuff kind of blows my mind. Um, mood, it's supposed to predict the risk of major depression or bipolar, the risk of PTSD and the stress one, um, the risk of suicidal ideation, and this one's really intriguing, the risk of longevity. I don't, I'm not sure I'd want to know that, but anyway, they purport to be able to do that. Um, some more some more, more, you know, a lot of it's related to the oncology testing. So this is all oncology testing. Now we're at some infectious agent, specifically for Bartonella. And some hematology stuff. All right, and you will um, get a copy of that. So don't feel like, oh my gosh, she was going too fast. I couldn't write notes. You will get that so that you can access that if you need to. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the medicine section. Vaccines and toxoids has one new code for a new trivalent hepatitis B vaccine. It's the Cybevac. We have one new code in the gastroenterology section, which is really just replacing a category three code that is going away at the end of the year. Not much is changing there. It's just gotten promoted to um, a category one code. <coughs> All right, we have several codes that are being deleted in the otorhinolaryngology section. Um, the first three there, the audiometric testing of groups, 
Um, again, according to the AMA, clinical practice has just changed over time. These codes are outdated and obsolete because they're all um, a lot of manual testing. And we do more automated computer type testing now. So um, I have here no replacements. That's what you're going to find in your book. But some of this stuff, because um, it's not a direct replacement, right? But a lot of this testing is now being done by auditory evoked potential testing. So you may want to go look at that section 92650 to 53 if you think you still do some of this. And then we have that short increment sensitivity index. Um, because of these changes, there's a lot of changes to the audiology guidelines. Um, stuff, as I said, directs you over to the unlisted codes. So you may want to review that if you do any of this um, coding, if any of this is in your wheelhouse. Okay, the one thing we're going to go over in tomorrow's webinar and this webinar, because I think it's about a mix of whether this is um, hard coded in the CDM versus coded by actual HIM professionals, is the um, cardiac cath stuff. And it's it can be pretty complicated what they did, I think. So I want to spend a, a little bit of time here. This is for the congenital cardiac anomalies. It's now going to be based on the heart anatomy, whether it's um, normal or abnormal native connections. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. So you can see that we have um, right heart catheterization, normal and abnormal, left heart catheterization, which is actually both. It's normal or abnormal. So left heart cath is left heart cath. And then we have right and left heart cath, normal or abnormal. Okay. All right, so again, to try and help you out here a little bit, and there's, uh, again, a lot more information in your CPT book, but normal native connections would mean that the blood flow goes the way we expect it to go through the chambers of the heart. Okay, so some examples of normal native connections would be an isolated atrial septal defect, a ventricular septal defect, or a PDA. And that's going to be, uh, it's going to use those three codes. You'll notice I've got the same 93595 is on both of these because that's the left heart cath. It doesn't matter whether it's normal or abnormal. Um, the abnormal would mean that there are alternative connections for the blood pathway. So some examples of that would be a, a single ventricle. If you have a single ventricle, you can't um, go the normal way of the blood. Um, if the great arteries are transposed, that would be another example. Tetralogy of flow, um, valvular atresia, or an unbalanced AV canal defect. And again, I just, this is, this is not everything and, and all, but I just wanted to give you some examples. You know, the blood's going to come through here and here. It's the oxygen poor blood. It's coming through the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle. Um, it gets pushed up via the pulmonic valve and out to the lungs, comes back. It doesn't show this very well. The pulmonary veins comes back, um, goes into the left atrium, down the left ventricle, and is pushed out through the aorta to everywhere it needs to go. So you can see in this, this would be a, a ventricular septal defect. The blood is still flowing the way we expect the blood to flow. So that's a normal connection. An abnormal connection, um, this is actually tetralogy of Fallot. So the big problem here is this stenotic pulmonary valve. And because this valve is stuck shut, the blood can't go the way it's supposed to go into the pulmonary arteries. And so instead it gets forced into here, into the aorta, which is obviously no good. But that's just um, an example for you of what they mean by normal and abnormal connections. Um, we also have two new add-on codes uh, for services that are provided during heart catheterization. So that first one up there, the 3D um, echocardiography real-time, 
uh, that would allow for acquisition of additional data sets without having to go offline and reconstruct and get a report back. Uh, provides visualization of the cardiac valves and congenital abnormalities. So the AMA more and more, I feel like, is writing books <laughs> for their long descriptions. So key things to pull out of this. This is for during transesophageal echo, which means it can be added to any indication during transesophageal echo or transthoracic echo for congenital cardiac anomalies. So that means that if it's transthoracic echo, it can only be added if you're doing um, an echocardiography for congenital anomalies. The cardiac output measurement, the thermodilution or other method performed during cardiac catheterization, of course, these both say list separately. Um, so I put down here, and it's, again, in your book, in your notes, that you would use this with 93593 through 93597. Um, note that you would also report the, uh, 93563 to 68 separately for cardiac catheterization for congenital heart defects because there can be some variability in the cardiovascular anatomy that's encountered. There's also, and I didn't put it in here, but again, it is in your instructions. Be careful about your left heart catheterization when you're looking at congenital anomalies because the left heart is not always the left heart if you have certain um, defects in the anatomy. So there are notes for that in the book. Uh, just something to take a look at and be careful of when you're coding these things. All right, so here are our deleted codes with their suggested replacements. So, you know, right heart catheterization used to be pretty simple. We now have two codes for the normal and abnormal anatomy. So that's basically what you're going to see as we go down the line here is it's just been split into two. Okay, and there's our indicator um, dilution studies that uh, have kind of been compressed into one, that 93598, which is the new code. Here's our books. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, information there, but basically what they are doing is trying to make it very clear what's included and what's not included with the ablation. So, um, and there's, we're gonna talk about that on a couple of the slides left, but basically they want to tell you that the um, EP 3D mapping and the left atrial pacing and recording are bundled into 93653. Um, the intracardiac echo, and again, the 3D mapping are bundled into 93656. And there's a couple of exclusions um, as far as what you can and can't do. A lot of information, but they're just adding to our little books there, right? To try and make it very clear. Um, a theme I think I've heard over the last several years is they want to add as much as possible into the description because people don't always use the notes that are available. And so if they can put as much as possible in here to tell you what this includes, you're less likely to try and add codes for things that are already included in this overarching code. All right, so I, I've got a few things in red font there, and those are the changes. Right, so they added 93653 to what included the mapping and the pacing. 93654 already told you it included the, the mapping and the pacing. So basically, again, that's just a little, um, hopefully a little cheat sheet for you. But if you do transeptal catheterization, ICE and EP evaluation of pacemaker or ICD, they added that, those can be reported with those ablation codes. 
93656 includes the mapping, the um, intracardiac echo, and the transeptal. And they have a nice little table in the book that's available to you that kind of tells you what you could do, what's bundled, what would never be done with any of these, just again, to kind of help you out there. All right, these new codes have caused a little bit of confusion already because these two new codes are replacing G0424, which is our code for pulmonary rehabilitation. But these codes, if you notice, read as though they are the professional services only. And we said a few slides back that we have to keep in mind that the AMA writes this for physicians, by physicians. Um, I, I think it's a little bit unfortunate wording the way they chose to do this, but this is your pulmonary rehab code selection for next year. So there is without pulse ox and with pulse ox. The AMA is not expecting to see this build without pulse ox very often, but because it includes the pulse oximetry, don't try and also report pulse oximetry with this. That's going to cause some billing problems. So even though they say physician or other qualified healthcare professional, this is also what you're going to use for your um, facility reporting of pulmonary rehab. We have one code that's been deleted out of the autonomic function section. Um, and again, I, I don't have a lot to say about this. Uh, according to the AMA, this is obsolete now wouldn't be done and there are other codes for testing this same sort of thing, other ways this is done. All right, we have five new codes to report remote therapeutic monitoring services. These three are the actual um, Oops, well, that's not good. I just, <laughs> just found a problem there. That one, that is not a right description for that. These three codes are for the, I'll get that corrected before that goes out. These three codes are for the actual recording and transmission. So these would be the, the technical component, basically. And the last two codes are representing the physician services, um, broken down first 20 minutes and additional 20 minutes for the professional time in interpreting the testing. Again, this is another trend, right, in the way things are going. There's a lot more um, remote monitoring services, and there is a lot of information in the book on this. But we're using these codes to report monitoring during a 30-day period. If you monitor for less than 16 days, which would be less than the halfway point, you know, more than the halfway point of your 30 days, it doesn't get reported. And you're not going to use these codes if there's a more specific monitoring service um, for what you're doing. Okay. Uh, 98975 is reported only once per episode of care, so basically once a month. Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're using this for remote monitoring of uh, device data, it has to be a medical device as defined by the FDA. But it doesn't have to be a um, device per se. It can be either objective data generated by a device, or it could be subjective inputs to a device by the patient. So it could be the patient logging um, themselves, how they're feeling or what they're doing, that kind of thing. Okay. Pretty important that the services have to be ordered by a physician or other qualified health professional. And I don't believe it's a requirement, but it's probably pretty good practice to let the patient know that they will have a charge for this. Because I, I can imagine if it was me, sometimes I would think that I'm just providing helpful information to my physician and not understanding that he's actually going to generate maybe a separate charge for that.
All right, let's talk about the category three codes. And we are going to talk in particular, as I said, about those ones that would um, more often tend to be hard coded or be sitting in a CDM. So I don't have 100% of the category three codes out here. Um, tune in tomorrow for the rest of them. I just it's just so much information guys it, this was a logical at least semi-logical way to break this apart and not have everybody sitting here for two three hours because nobody wants that probably least of all me all right so we have um several new devices for an implantable synchronized diaphragmatic stimulation system so this helps to um stimulate your diaphragm to actually um is it contract? I think that's right. Contract in rhythm with uh, the heartbeat. So basically what it does is push up, make uh, or actually come down so that when the heart is pumping, there's more room to do that. And it actually can help with uh, congestive heart failure. It's pretty amazing stuff. Not done by a lot of places yet, but um, if your hospital is thinking about doing them, there are new codes for this. And there's a whole new subsection to um, explain all this. There's guidelines, there's parenthetical notes, um, all kinds of stuff around these particular set of codes. And we have a lot of them, right, because they always break them down into um, programming and implantation and interrogation and, and all that different stuff. They've got codes for everything. <clears throat> okay, treatment of ambilopia. Again, we're in the remote stuff, right? Online digital program stuff. So one code for the educational setup initial session, and then another code for uh, reporting per calendar month of the assessment of the program and the report and all that kind of good stuff that goes with things. Okay, the next two codes are quantitative ultrasound tissue characterization. We already have category one codes for if you're doing um, elastography versus via ultrasound. So that's, you know, elastography is the measurement of how elastic the tissue is. This would be characterizing the tissue for something else. Um, it can be used to look at the, the liver for fat content. It can be used to look at the breast to separate benign from malignant masses. It can be looked uh, at the eye to separate benign from malignant masses. And you'll notice that it, um, it's separated out by whether or not you're doing um, a diagnostic ultrasound examination of that same area, or if you're just doing the tissue characterization. So one's an add-on code, one is not. All right, automated analysis of the CT study for vertebral um, fracture. Again, that's, that's not the CT, it would, it's proprietary software that uses an existing CT data set. And um, it actually does some additional uh, interpretation of the bone density and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, let's see, 0692 is not dialysis, but pretty close to dialysis. That's not done uh, in many places either. Um, 0693, the computer-based markerless, which is the key component of this kinetic motion analysis. And then we have 0694 to report the real-time intraoperative 3D imaging of breast or axillary lymph node tissue. So note that that is intraoperative. It's reported one time for each specimen. And you've got some additional notes that were added in particular in the um, mastectomy section of the code book to direct you out here. Uh, body surface activation mapping of 
pacemaker. We have um, a couple of codes in on that. Uh, it's done to optimize the electrical um, synchrony of the pacemaker. It includes the recording and connection um, of a resynchronization device. Um, let's see. So the keys here are if if you're doing this at the time of implant or replacement, you're going to this code. If it's not at the time of implantation, it's during a follow-up evaluation, you'd be using that one. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We have established two new codes for single organ, uh, for multiple organs, excuse me. We already have 0648 and 0649T that are for the single organ. This is going to allow you to do the same thing on multiple organs. Uh, molecular fluorescent imaging, um, supposed to be much better at identifying biological activity that isn't quite melanoma, but could very likely morph into melanoma. So um, that's a good thing as well. And you know, you guys know the drill on the, the category three codes. This is, this is in here because it's new and emerging technology. It's not going to be used at a ton of places yet, but they want to track them. They want to see if it needs to uh, graduate up to a category one code, at which point things tend to be a lot better reimbursed and covered and that kind of thing. All right, some more remote therapeutic monitoring stuff of online digital cognitive behavioral therapy programs. These have just exploded during the um, pandemic too, right? So note that that is uh, odd that they've done this this way, in my opinion. This says per 30 days, and this says per calendar month. Um, slightly different, but basically the same. So just keep that in mind. Uh, eye tracking devices, treatment of ambilopia, kind of we've already talked about that. This is just a slightly different um, process using the eye tracking device. We have some intradermal, uh, oh, did I skip one there? The intradermal cancer um, immunotherapy stuff is um, not subcutaneous injection, it is intradermal, so keep that in mind. Wow, we're, we're on the home stretch here, guys. This is almost the end of, of these codes being added. So we have the non-invasive arterial plaque analysis. Again, this is a, a proprietary software program. So it's not actually doing the CTA, it is taking the CTA um, data and um, doing some additional assessment on it to actually be able to see what the vessel wall looks like and what the plaque looks like and how stable it is. So several of those codes, depending on what part of that you're doing, if you're doing, you know, full, full report, I'm sorry, full procedure, data preparation, um, actual analysis, or just the interpretation and report. See, I told you we were almost done with that. Okay, deleted codes. Um, we only have one here and there's no direct replacement for it, so. I always thought that it was weird that that one was a category three anyway when it was um, a lab test. <laughs> oh, I lied, we have more deleted codes, sorry. Um, we also deleted the programming device evaluation for the mechanical electrical skin interface. Um, I can't say much about that either. Uh, there wasn't a lot of comment as to why that one was deleted. All right, and then we have one revision, which is, again, just kind of a clarifying statement there that this is unilateral. Um, so if it's done on both breasts, it would warrant a 50 modifier or two line reporting, depending on what your payer wants. All right, and that is 
finally it, guys. <laughs> Turn it back over to Marie to see if we have any questions. We do. Um, we have, I think, a few questions in the QA panel. Um, I don't know if it's easier for you to just open that up and uh, read them, Jen, um, if you want to shorten Yeah, we can. Let's see. We can do that. <laughs> 98977. Seven. Originally, it was focused on physical therapy. There is additional information that this, well, first of all, let's, <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee I can answer all of these live because I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So 98977 nine, seven is the remote therapeutic monitoring device supply with scheduled recording and or programmed alert transmission for the musculoskeletal system. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. I know there was some more information um, presented at the symposium as far as what, what type of devices, what you would be doing for that um, musculoskeletal monitoring. Um, I don't know if we said, but we will make sure that all of these gets, get answered in, you know, like a Word document and it will go out to everybody. So we'll make sure that, um, that I get an answer for you once I can do a little more research on that. All right, for the new pulmonary rehab codes, we do monitor the pulse ox. How does it need to be documented? A continuous waveform or the value for each piece of equipment? Now, we did not hear that it had to be that specific as the second one, just um, that they want it um, documented that you did use pulse oximetry throughout. And like I said, I thought it was interesting that they, that they created two codes, but they said, we almost never expect this to be done without pulse oximetry. So I would say however you are documenting your, if a patient just comes in and needs prolonged pulse oximetry monitoring, however you're documenting that, that should be fine for this. Um, what areas could and would use 9897577 to 77 for the remote therapeutic monitoring? And let's see, 75 is the respiratory, and seven six is the respiratory, and seven seven is the musculoskeletal. And um, again, uh, it has to be, or most of the time, it's going to be device data. So I am not a hundred percent sure how this would be used because the way that this was explained to me, how this would be used, would be primarily by the physicians, right? They want my I don't know, Fitbit data or something, just to see what my heart rate has been doing, that kind of stuff. Um, but I can definitely see a hospital um, clinic type thing doing, actually, you know, helping with this and providing this service to get the monitoring done. So I'm, I will do, since it looks like most of these questions are on the, whoops, oh, you need to see that, huh? Um, most of these questions are on the um, remote monitoring. I will make sure that we uh, that I go ahead and do some additional um, research on that. Okay, and then 0692T, the therapeutic ultrafiltration. If this is only to be used, they will do filtration, a different code off days for our dialysis patients. I will go ahead and get some more information on that one as well. I'm doing great with answering questions, right? Would respiratory therapy be able to use these codes? I'm not, I, uh, I'm not sure. Are we talking about the pulmonary rehab codes? I'm not sure which codes we're talking about there. Maybe if you can put something else in there. Uh, contradicting info for the re remote therapeutic monitoring on who would provide these codes and if they are specific. Um, we have OT that's interested in this service. What types of devices? What if the provider doesn't provide the device? Okay, looks like we want lots more information on the remote therapeutic monitoring codes. And they did give 
lots and lots of um, information and guidelines, but there's nothing quite as good as, you know, like specific devices that would be used. So let me see um, what else I can find on that to help you guys out with that sort of thing. We'll make sure that we um, write a book in the Q&A for that. Uh, 93653, oh, the respiratory for the remote therapeutic monitoring. Yeah, I don't, it, it, none of these codes or not very often are any of these codes restricted to certain things. If you're performing the services for that code, you could use it, but we'll make sure to get more information on those. 93653 and 54. You'd think I would have these memorized. Let's just go through that. Let me do this. Sorry, guys. I'm not trying to make you too dizzy. Okay, um, are we going over what's included with these? These are all the um, ablation codes that have all been revised. You know, the change from including to with, I don't think is a big deal, but you can see here that they are now including the right atrial pacing, which always was, catheter ablation of arrhythmogenic focus, including the 3D mapping, and also including the left atrial pacing and recording from the coronary sinus or the left atrium. And notice that they've got when performed. So that doesn't mean that it has to be performed to use the code, but if it is performed, it's included in those procedures. Okay. Like I said, hopefully some of these notes help you as well. And there are just a ton of guidelines sitting in the CPT book as far as what is included and what can be separately reported, especially in that, that new table that's there. That is super helpful. I just couldn't, um, couldn't find a nice way to get the whole table in here, but it is in your CPT book. Okay, did I miss anything? The difference between remote physiologic monitoring and remote therapeutic monitoring. So I guess we're talking about the two different sections that are there. And the physiology is, let me get, Okay, so the therapeutic monitoring, and, and I'm not making this up, this is what, um, what is in the book as far as the remote therapeutic monitoring system, which includes the musculoskeletal system, the respiratory system. It could be monitoring for therapy adherence or therapy response. That represents the review and monitoring of the data related to signs, symptoms of a therapeutic response. So again, it can be the objective device generated data, you know, what my heart rate says from a device that's sitting on my wrist, or it could be inputs um, that I'm making as a patient to say, you know, it's, it's 10, 11, and I feel like my heart is racing right now. Um, it's, those are reflective of therapeutic responses that provide um, a representation of a patient status. It seems like there was some good information as far as what the physiologic monitoring was. Let me get over to that real quick. Wow, there are, there is, um, no joke, there is two and a half pages in the book on all of these different things and what can be reported and what they would, you know, what the different things are, what time you can count, that sort of thing. Uh, 
All right, I have my marching orders to provide um, a little bit more information as far as the remote therapeutic monitoring. Uh, my bad, I didn't think that was, I thought most people were gonna skip right over that because uh, most places in the hospital, I don't really see a lot of different places using this, but with everything going remote, I should have known better. <laughs> Awesome. Um, looks like that's the end of the questions then. So like Jen said, she'll get those answered and we'll get those out to everybody. And by end of day, day today, we will also send out the CEUs and the link to the recording and slide deck. We'll make that one change and get that posted shortly. Um, and I think that's all. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sure we'll see some of you tomorrow as well. And have a great day, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you.